Good evening and thank you. We're so pleased to be partnering with the Montgomery Public Library and with Psycho Lesur Library System and to have all you joining us for this event in the Moving Words Writers Across Minnesota virtual series featuring the talents of Jack L. High, William D. Green, Sheila O'Connor, and Gwen Westerman. I am Wendy Warden, Programs and Services Assistant at the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress-designated Minnesota Center for the Book. As we get started this evening, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we broadcast tonight. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. The Friends has coordinated the year-long Minnesota Book Awards program for 14 years. And as Minnesota's Center for the Book, we, program, we produce programming that benefits all ages and reaches all corners of the state. This programming is supported by funding for the Center for the Book included in Minnesota's K-12 Education Bill. We are grateful to all the state representatives and senators who advocated for that funding. On to our main event. This series is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Government Department of Education and additional support is provided by the Harlan Boss Foundation for the Arts, the Hovnander Family Foundation and Education Minnesota. We will have a reading and conversation followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. Biographies of each panelist will be posted in the chat and we'll be following up this program with a brief survey to get your feedback. So please, please be on the lookout for that. Uh, next chapter booksellers in St. Paul has partnered with us on book sales this evening. Please visit their website to purchase titles by our featured authors and we'll put links in the chat throughout the evening. To start things off, we'll have a brief reading and presentation from each author. First, I'd like to welcome Jack L. High, writer on history, medicine, science, and crime. Welcome, Jack. Thanks, Wendy, and uh, it's good to be here. I'm grateful to the Montgomery Library and to the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this event, and it's wonderful always to do the uh, events and getting out um, to all kinds of audiences. I really enjoy it. And I'm here to talk with you about a book that I have recently published. It's called The Lost Brothers. It's a nonfiction book about three boys who disappeared while um, going out to play in their neighborhood park in 1951, three little brothers, aged eight, six, and four. And uh, it's also about their families struggle to reconcile themselves with that mysterious, devastating disappearance of such a large chunk of their family and with their struggles to find out what happened to the boys, their search for those three brothers continues to this day. There is an active investigation going on right now to, to, to dredge up more information about the fate of the brothers and to try and figure out what happened to them. And I'll begin just by reading a very short opening section of the book. Many years ago, I called a phone number in a classified ad that pleaded for information on a trio of missing children. I didn't know it, but that ad appeared in the newspaper every year. I spoke with Betty and Kenneth Klein, who invited me to drive from Minneapolis to rural Monticello, Minnesota, to meet them. They lived in an old farmhouse and had been married for 56 years. Much of that time, a nightmare of not knowing, endless searching and waiting. Decades earlier, they had lost three young sons. The boys vanished in a single afternoon, unaccountably and without resolution. 
Betty, 73, was calm and determined, and she did most of the talking. Kenneth, 81, had recently undergone treatment for cancer. He looked pained and spoke slowly. The clients had a large family, five remaining sons, five grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren at that time. They felt devoted to their family, but they could not stop thinking about the family that was missing. Even when entertaining a guest inside their house, they focused part of their attention outside. Their ears were attuned to arrivals on their gravel driveway. The crunching of tires, footsteps, stray male voices, these sounds demanded the client's notice. Betty still kept a collection of the boys, clothing, photographs, and a bit of their schoolwork. Someday, somehow, Kenneth Jr., David, and Danny might come home. Some people told Betty and Kenneth to give up, to stop searching for their missing boys after so long. The clients refused. Kenneth pointed out that nobody had ever proven the boys dead. Nothing could stop him and Betty from worrying about them. These kids come into the world, he said, and whatever happens, you've got to stand behind them. I left, conscious of the sounds I made on the gravel driveway, and wrote a magazine article about the Kleins and their missing boys. Published in 1998, it gave me false conviction. I thought I understood the complexities of this case and the purgatory in which the Kleins lived. I thought the case of Betty and Kenneth's vanished sons was doomed to have no ending. I was wrong. 15 years later, I received an email from a sheriff's deputy in Wright County, Minnesota. Something was developing in the case of the missing Klein boys. It could still be solved. So that's how the book begins. And uh, as you heard, I got into this story and uh, investigating it and reporting on it back at, uh, actually in 1997 when I read that newspaper ad in the Star Tribune newspaper. And um, so it's been, what, 20, 23 years since then. And a, a lot has happened over that time. I was actively involved in the story, of course, when I was writing that initial magazine article, uh, but kept touch with the Klein family. And um, then, her, as I mentioned at the end of that section, around uh, 2013, heard from that Wright County Sheriff, Jessica Miller, who was um, asking me for what I had still about the Kleins and the case, because uh, she and her partner, who were both working um, on their own time, not on Wright County Sheriff's time, to investigate this case, were drawing together everything they could find. Thing, uh, information that had been accumulated by people like me who had written about it, also the Minneapolis Police Department, which had almost nothing uh, still about this case, the FBI, which had some uh, information, and, and another investigator, police officer, who on his own time had done some investigating in the 1990s. So um, it's a case with really long tentacles and has not let go of me for such a long time. One uh, way in which I feel very lucky in this story was that I was able to write about it not only as a book, The Lost Brothers, but I had a completely new second chance to write about it in a podcast uh, that I did in a production by Twin Cities PBS. That podcast is called Long Lost. And it also, it tells the same story of the missing brothers, the investigation into what happened to them and the, um, the travails of the Klein family. But it's a podcast, not a book. And so it demanded in, in this different medium, a different way of telling the stories, the story through sound. And so uh, I went back to square one and, and came up with this audio, audio focused 
story that became a six-part podcast. If you're interested in hearing it, you can hear it uh, through Apple Podcasts or uh, Spotify or any place through which you can get podcasts. So the book is called The Lost Brothers. The podcast is called Long Lost. This story is still developing. Um, uh, Even now, the Wright County investigators, Jessica Miller and Lance Sauls, Uh, continue to gather information. They've developed a list of suspects, a a plan of attack. Uh, Unfortunately, the uh, one thing holding them up at the moment is that the Minneapolis Police Department is in um, great um, disorder at the Mm -hmm. moment and has uh, no resources or um, initiative or, to be frank, interest in looking into a a case like this, which up till now has not been conclusively solved. So I'm hoping that in the years to come, we will have a solution, an absolute solution to the case. But until then, that it will continue to move ahead. So I'm happy uh, um, at the end of this program uh, to answer any questions you may have about the book or the story or the podcast. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you to the remainder of our authors in this program. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, fascinating story. It's, I just, I stumbled on the podcast before I was putting this, this stuff together. And I, so I will, I look forward to, to uh, listening to it and see how it differs from, from the book. Um, and that, that link, I'm, I'm gesturing to the chat as if you can see, as if everyone can see the chat anyway. It's, it's to the right of my screen. There's a link to the podcast in the chat. Uh, next, we will bring up uh, Sheila O'Connor, who is a teacher of writing and a multi-genre author. And I absorbed her latest book, Evidence of V, in one sitting. So please welcome Sheila O'Connor. Thank you, Wendy. and. It's really an an honor for me to be on the panel with everyone, but in particular to follow um, Jack Alhai because I have found this story of the lost voice so compelling and in some ways crossing over with uh, my book that had come out this year because both of them deal with absence and long unresolved mysteries. So I was gonna talk a little bit tonight about um, Evidence of V, which is the uh, book that had recently won the Minnesota Book Award and is the book that has just come out this past year. Uh, Evidence of V is, was based actually on a family story. It's, it's called A Novel in Fragments, Facts, and Fiction because it is considered a multi-genre hybrid text that draws fiction, um, historical documents, and um, archival documents, photographs, all kinds of things to piece together the story of V. And the story of V is the story of my maternal grandmother, a woman that I never knew, never met, and actually did not know even existed until I was probably close to 15 or 16 years old. My mother was born in 1935 and was placed for adoption. She did not know that she had been adopted until she was actually in her 30s. So in the 1970s, she found out that she was adopted. And um, when she found out that she was adopted and when I found out that she was adopted a few years later, it was something that was put away in our family like so many adoptions from this time period. And many years later in 2001, um, I had not been able to let go of this story of this um, maternal grandmother whose name began with V and I, couldn't ever forget her and I didn't know anything about her. And I asked my mother based on um, a need that I felt to understand some historical trauma that had occurred in the family to get these documents that existed at the Minnesota Historical Society um, in the Gale Family Library. And the documents 
were where they had housed the um, files of girls, adolescent girls who had been incarcerated at the homeschool in Sauk Center in the 1930s. My mother's file, her mother's file, existed in those documents. I called the Gale Family Library and learned that that indeed my mother's file and her mother's file were there. But I also learned in that phone call in 2001 that the files were sealed for 100 years. And that if we were, if we had any desire or any chance of seeing these files, we had to petition through the Hennepin County Court. We did petition for full disclosure through the Hennepin County Court providing the death certificate of her biological mother. And we, were, we went in on a January afternoon. When we went into this file, we discovered for the first time that her mother had been incarcerated at the age of 15 and that she had been incarcerated for six years. And the first question, of course, upon discovering this information was what had she been incarcerated for? What was her crime that she had received a six year sentence? And I was unable to answer that in 2001. And it took me many years of, of uh, research, breadcrumb research, because very little existed on this information. But on this history, and this is a this is a fairly little known history, not only in Minnesota but across the United States. But what I eventually discovered was that there was a practice of incarcerating girls for immorality in the 1920s and the 1930s. And when the girls in Minnesota were sentenced, whether they were sentenced at the age of eight and they were sentenced as young as eight or 11 or 12 or 15, all of them were held until the age of 21. And that sense, that, uh, that atrocity of what had happened to these girls, which I felt in my heart and was later confirmed were probably themselves victims of sexual abuse, and what had it meant that they were considered immoral, but their abusers had gone free. And I dug into this history, and what I tried to do in this book was to piece together the history of these girls and imagine the history of my maternal grandmother. The part of the book that is imagined is actually her story. The part of the book that is based on historical documents has to do with the story of the practice of incarcerating these girls in Minnesota. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the opening of this just to get a sense of how I was working on the imaginative part of it. Where to start V's story? V at 15 in 1935. V sentenced until 21. For what? V, the family secret I discovered at 16. My mother's missing mother never mentioned to me once. Shh. The sound of V is silence. Girl of sealed history like all those other girls, sealed, therefore buried. State documents I now excavate for answers. An official file of facts that read like fiction. V, a fiction built of fragments as girls so often are. One of the things that I discovered in the file that was quite moving to me is that when V was incarcerated at 15, she was an aspiring singer and dancer and was actually working as an entertainer. At the age of 12, she had won um, a very large citywide singing contest that, I don't know, something like 8,000 people had been at Powderhorn Park to hear her sing to win this contest. And she really was genuinely as talented as she believed herself to be. And I was struck over and over again as an artist myself at the lost opportunities for a girl incarcerated for this length of time. And this begins with her debut at the Cascade Club. She enters the tunnel a little fox. Little fox is what he calls her. And she wears that clever nickname like a mask. Little fox led to the light. 
Little fox half glued together with rouge and paint and powder. Red lips pressed to paper like a kiss. Little fox, he whispers, soon you'll be my star. In the next room, men stripe along the bar, crowd the steamy darkness, wait for the girl to sashay into the spotlight, the girl to offer them a song, her skin. You'll still have your fur, he says, draping the fox stole on her shoulders, brushing his hand between her legs. Just dance, he says. A dance is all they want. So I guess what I'm hoping within this book, um, for all the years that I spent, the 15 years I spent trying to do this minute research and the years I spent writing it, is that it would illuminate this history and perhaps vindicate in some way the girls um, who were wrongly incarcerated for crimes that they didn't commit. They in fact had committed no crimes. It even says it in their it, in these documents that they had no crime. They were only um, committed as immoral or in danger of becoming immoral. And one of the goals in the book is that I'm hoping that um, more people will come forward who are descendants of the girls and even the girls themselves as I bring this story into light. So thank you so much. And I read it again. <laughs> I just I, I I was so taken with with the whole in danger of becoming immoral because honestly that would have would have been me singing dancing little nutball that I was at at sixteen um, so yeah I, fantastic Sheila thank you so much um, our next our next writer uh, with us this evening is Gwen Westerman. She's also a fantastic textile artist and an educator and a poet and many things. So Gwen, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you. Hello everyone. It's really good that you are all with us this evening. And um, I want to start with um, just this amazing new collection of Native Nations poets that has just come out from Norton Publishing. Uh, there are 160 poems in here um, from coast to coast and border to border, uh, edited by the U.S. Poet Laureate uh, Joy Harjo, along with Leanne Howe and Jennifer Elise Forster. Um, so, what I wanted to do is read from the Plains and Mountains section, which contains uh, my poem, uh, We Come From the Stars. And that's our, our Dakota um, origin story. Stellar nucleosynthesis. That explains where everything in our universe came from, according to astrophysicists who only recently discovered the cosmological constant causing the expansion of our universe. Our creation story tells us we came from the stars to this place, Bedote, where the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers converge. Our journey along Wanare Chonku in our universe, that stargazers later called the Milky Way, now disappearing in the excessive glow of a million, million urban uplights. The original inhabitants of this place, of our universe, we are Wichonkpi Oyate, star people, and will remain here as long as we can see ourselves in the stars. So it's a real honor to be part of uh, this collection. It was a long time coming. Um, in 1998, we, as a group of, of Native scholars, Native writers, Native artists, were told by um, 
someone from a literary association that Native American literature would never be taken seriously until there was a Norton anthology. And we were pretty incensed um, and it led us to create our own organization, our own conference, um, the Native American Literature Symposium, where for 20 years we uh, privileged the voices of Native scholars and Native artists. And um, check it out. Um, I write about a lot of different aspects of um, Dakota history, Dakota culture. I use Dakota language in my writing and a lot of it has to do with our connection to the land and the impact that the loss of land um, has had on everyone who lives in this place. And um, it's, it's a struggle sometimes um, there are, are negative aspects of um, our history, but there's also a lot of resilience and a lot of continual uh, resurgence and re-energization of our voices, of our, our uh, understanding of our place in this world. And um, I think it's really important to be able to write about those things, especially in these times. Um, last year, um, I was asked to participate in um, an exhibition of poetry and visual art that focused on the 1868 treaty. And um, I, went through article 10, that was my article. Um, there was visual art and music and uh, written word for each article of, of that treaty. And um, I went through and picked out words from this treaty article uh, that talks about um, Dakota and Lakota people are no longer gonna receive annuities, but instead they're gonna receive uh, goods, uh, clothing, um, cattle, farm implements, instead of, instead of annuities. So um, this is the piece that I wrote for that. It's called Wikchimina Psalm Wikchimina, uh, ten, 10 by 10. From time to time, year to year, Dakudena unkiksuyapikte, in lieu of all treaties heretofore made, Wolwapi Unkahapi Owaski, and the manner of their delivery, Dana Stod Unyapik A Unkogahapi, in testimony of all which we receive, Daku Owas Unchipi Unyahapikte, each person, each family, each lodge. To way owas we chaw unkiksuyapikte shall be named, entitled to be present. Chaje we chayatapik wana four years, twelve years, fourteen years, thirty years. Tokatakia in no event withdrawn or discontinued. Ohini each lodge, each family settled. Dakudena et chunkumpikte permanently. He unnipikte. So that's um, a lot of what I do is incorporate the cultural language um, and um, let people know that we still speak our language, that we can write poetry in Dakota language as well, and um, put it out there for the world to hear and to see. The other piece that, that I thought I would just quickly um, go through is something that I wrote this week. I wasn't able to write from March until 
last month, basically. It just didn't, it wouldn't come out. Um, and so I'll read this for you quickly. Um, homebound used to mean an elderly or sick person who would not leave their house. Thursday night visitation of the Indian Southern Baptist Church included the homebound, mostly old people to my child's eye. Visitation was boring to me. No other children to play with, riding in my grandma's car, visiting people I did not recognize. I remember it with sadness and melancholy. While we are not homebound in that same specific sense, we seem cut off physically from the people we know and love. Text messages and photo op sunsets or suppers cannot replace the sound of unmasked laughter, the shared smiles, connected and illuminating eyes, eyes that lose their sparkle when nose and mouth are covered. How have Muslim cultures been affected by this pandemic in places where women are veiled, in the deserts where men and women cover their faces? In this, what is meant by the light, or is this what is meant by the light of your smile? That it is really connected to your eyes, mouth, and eyes working together to convey that light. Then what is lost in the thousand yard stare of trauma? The connection between eyes and mouth and that spark in us, that blue light of our souls. What is being broken in us? shuttered or smothered or dimmed because we cannot see each other in the smiles, physical smiles, actual smiles, not virtual of others, real smiles, honest smiles, heartfelt smiles, not the posed or perfunctory or plumped college and smiles disconnected from feeling by the need or requirement of performance. I went to visit my junior high music teacher in 1997, who was by then selling insurance. The first words out of his mouth when he saw me were, I'd recognize that smile anywhere. I was so happy to hear that, that I smiled even more. Someone recognized me, someone who had known me as a child. I felt whole again. What do we lose? when we can't see a smile. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen, for, for bringing Dakota language into this place and, and for making us think about smiling. And you have to imagine all of the happy poetry noises around you as, <laughs> as you're reading. That's one thing that I definitely miss about not doing these programs in physical space is being able to hear audiences go ah. <laughs> so i really i appreciate that thank you so much uh, for our last uh presentation portion of the evening i would like to welcome uh professor and historian william green whose book children of lincoln won the hoganander history award this last year so welcome bill for having me here and uh, for being a part of this panel. Um, you know, before I get started, I just wanted to uh, uh, say that uh, Gwen, we were on a panel together a couple years ago looking at uh, paintings for the Capitol and trying to deal with new expressions of what it is to be a Minnesota through the art form. And uh, I still think about your input. Uh, I use some of it in class. So I want to thank you for the gift of, of uh, a vision of being able to visualize art in a different way. Um, I hope we get a chance to talk uh, at some other time. But anyway, I just want to say that. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about Children of Lincoln. Um, I'm not going to read anything, but this is what it looks like. It's a beautiful cover. And uh, what, what it is about is, well, it's, several, it's about several things, but one of it is that it's about um, 
the uh, the stories. There are so many incredible stories in Minnesota history that historians tend to overlook, have historically overlooked. Um, and I, I have found a lot of satisfaction in digging deeply into those stories with no necessarily, with no, no real intent to try to prove a, a, a larger point, um, but as much as to just discover these personalities who lived before us. And in digging deeper into their stories, uh, gaining some kind of insight into uh, some of the bigger questions that we're dealing with today. Um, it is a reason why I teach history for the most part, try to make sense of the present, the present and to try to find the language to describe what is going on. Um, I find that the absence of language is, is, is really a, um, a, a, a source of, of powerlessness. Um, of, 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 of feeling hopeless in a sense when you can't articulate what you see, when you can't describe the world in your own terms. Um, I, I, I find that that's more readily remedied through literature, um, but history is not that far away from the literature, especially when you're trying to unearth um, the human dynamic to try to make sense of it and if possible, to find the music in the way that people express themselves. So, you know, it was in, in trying to capture all that that I, uh, I wrote this book, Children of Lincoln. Uh, I want to really begin by um, hearkening back to 1876 in Washington, D.C. Um, at a gathering, it was the unfurling of the Emancipation Monument Memorial um, it was a place where a lot of old friends gathered, and it was a place where the first monument was to be presented publicly. It was a monument of, and, and many of the listeners perhaps are familiar with, with that particular monument. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is standing on the pedestal, his arms outstretched. Uh, emancipation is on one of the documents he's holding, and at his knee is um, a huddled Freedman, uh, a former slave, a black man, um, wearing only a cloth um, and bowed, and hit, uh, around his wrists are, um, are chains. The chain has been broken, so in one sense he's free, in one sense I suppose in the mind of the, of the, um, of the artist who, who, who uh, cast the, the impression. Uh, that this was a sign of hope, that he was free to pursue his, his own future, his own destiny, his own opportunities. Um, but it was interesting to, to, to see the reaction, or to read the reaction of the news reporter who, who reported on what he saw at that moment once the, the thing was unfurled. Um, in attendance were uh, Ulysses S. Grant, President of the United States, and a few other dignitaries. And the, the, the main speaker was Frederick Douglass. Um, he was America's favorite African-American. Uh, he seemed to appear and be invited to every stage where there was a major um, event being held to commemorate um, the, the nobility of the Republican cause. And he, he received a lot of respect and, and deservedly so. Um, he was to speak at this particular uh, dedication and um, you can still pull up his, his address uh, uh, online. Um, the speech ran for about 16 pages. And uh, in it, he, as one would expect, expect um, uh, sang the praises of the martyred president. Um, but right in the middle of his speech, always overlooked by historians and commentators of the time, was this one reference um, that I think tells it all about how he viewed um, the friends of the race during that time, considering the history that was being, that, that was occurring in, in America with regard to race relations. He says basically to the, to the audience, the majority of whom are white and presumably um, uh, supporters of abolitionism in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and who perhaps fought in, this, in the Civil War, 
uh, and were proud supporters of Lincoln's vision. He, he says to them, uh, you are the children of Lincoln, which is where I get the title for my book. You are the children of Lincoln, but to us, he's referring to the African-American, we are at best his stepchildren. Um, and it seemed to characterize for me a lot about the nature of race relations, certainly at that time, and I think to some extent presently as well. Um, his point seemed to be that, first of all, you know, the monument itself was, uh, the, the idea for the monument began with a, a black woman who was emancipated as a result of the act of Lincoln. She learned in 65 of his assassination and felt that there should be some kind of dedication to him, some sort of monument. And so even though she was, she was a servant still, even though she was free, she was a servant, meager funds. She dedicated money that would serve as the seed capital for the construction of his monument. Um, slowly but surely, money was collected, uh, primarily initially, from um, black troopers uh, who served in the Civil War. And much later, uh, white donors began to contribute. But the, the, the image that would be considered for this monument was not something that African Americans had anything to say of anything about. Uh, it was done outside of their midst. They saw the monument for the first time uh, some eight years later. And the reporter following or uh, covering the scene in Washington uh, makes this interesting observation. He's writing for the New York Times. He said that when the, when the banner was removed from the statute for the first time, um, there was a gasp. Most of the people there were impressed. They were in awe. They applauded. Um, but that the, the handful of African Americans who stood in the periphery of the group seemed to show a degree, and this is his term, of disquiet. And he seemed to uh, feel a little, uh, he expressed um, a little confusion as to what that meant. He didn't understand because clearly this was a great thing being done for African Americans, showing the work and the grace of Abraham Lincoln. In looking at this statue, um, the statue itself is, is in, it has become controversial you know, over the past couple of years. And um, I think it is fair to say that if you were to look at the statue itself, it would look like the embodiment of paternalism, white paternalism over you know, the, 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 the African American, that the African American is freed but never fully equal to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the person who made him free, and that there's really no ep, uh, ind indication of communication, of equality between these two figures. And so the African-American is always in a subordinate position, as, as, as uh, shown in this particular statue, at least. Um, what's interesting about that is that uh, it's not clear at all that Abraham Lincoln would have been happy with that depiction of him. Uh, in historian Doris Kern Goodwin's book, uh, A Team of Rivals, she, she talks about at the end of the book, uh, Abraham Lincoln coming to Richmond after the war. Um, he, get, he got off the boat with his son. He's walking through the streets along the wharf in Richmond, Virginia, and African Americans begin to see him and they recognize him and they flock to him. And when they get close to him, they fall to their knees and sing his praises. And Lincoln, as Kern Goodman uh, characterizes it, uh, looks discomforted by what's happening. He feels very much uncomfortable with it because he's, he's calling to these African Americans to stand up. You don't bow to me, you bow to God. I'm not a God, I'm just a regular guy. Um, so it, it struck me that, that Lincoln perhaps would not have been pleased with this depiction of him in some, some sort of uh, godly state, um, angelic state. Uh, well, in any event, um, in the, in the abs in the, at the end of the speech, uh, 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 Frederick Douglass is applauded. Um, it's, it's, it's received very well. And uh, within months after his speech, um, 
a presidential election is held. <laughs> and one of the candidates for the presidency is Rutherford B. Hayes. He's a, he's, a, he's a Republican from Ohio and had fought in the Civil War and had supported the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. He seemed like a good guy. <laughs> On the other hand, he was running against the governor of the state of New York, a Democrat, Samuel Tilden. And Tilden represented a much more conservative view of race relations and appealed to that strain in his, uh, among his constituents. Um, the election was held and it was deadlocked. It eventually went to the uh, electoral college, and it was deadlocked there. So there was a there was there was there was no indication of who would become president of the United States. A person who would be the heir of Abraham Lincoln's vision, or a person who would reflect the conservatism of the day, the anti-black sentiment of the day. Rutherford H B Hayes told his 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 agents to tell um, the Democrats, the Southern Democrats that if they threw their support to him, he, the first thing he would do as president is to remove the Union troops from the South. And in doing so, he would basically allow the Southern white supremacists to have their way with African Americans. They did, and he did. He removed the federal troops from the South. And after that, um, white supremacy took on a whole new level of, of intensity where African Americans were, were, uh, were, uh, were killed, were oppressed for the, for, the, for the next several decades. And what's noteworthy about this moment is that that period of, of tyranny, of tragedy, is occurring on the watch of uh, the, the, of, of the time where the friends of Lincoln and presumably the friends of African Americans were in power. This did not occur when the enemies of emancipation of freedom and of African Americans were in power. No. It was those who had fought for equality. It is those who fought for, for enfranchisement and for freedom who basically allowed for white supremacy to spread across the South and pop up in places in the North. Um, so, you know, I think that, 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 that I mean, my, my book basically looks at, all right, this was, this was an interesting thing where um, the, the, the friends of Lincoln who had ratified the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, the friends of African Americans who had fought for four years to keep the union together and for the last two years to, to free all men, um, basically upon ratifying the 15th Amendment, watch all of the soul and spirit of those enactments be corrupted by um, the tyranny of the Klan and white supremacist groups throughout the South, unimpeded in effect by, um, by their friends who occupied high offices. Um, I wanted to know what was the attitude in Minnesota at this time. Another reason why I wrote the book is because you, 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 you don't find a lot of materials on um, what's going on in the North during a period of Reconstruction. Reconstruction tends to be viewed as, as Northern occupation of the South uh, and of the, the, the fight against white supremacy, or at least the tyranny of white supremacy. But it seldom has much to do with what is going on in the North during a period of Reconstruction. And a lot is going on in the North. And in particular, you find nothing, for all intents and purposes, that expressly looks at what's going on in Minnesota. Minnesota is a state in which uh, the immigrant immigration patterns have increased. They've stepped up. More immigrants are moving into Minnesota. The economy is shifting. Um, it's becoming I mean, the, the agricultural breadbasket, but also railroads are becoming quite powerful in, in, in the state at this time. Um, it, is, it is a time when women are beginning to agitate for suffrage. And it's a time where people are moving from one section of the country to the next in order to find jobs. A lot of things are happening 
and a lot of things are happening in Minnesota. And the question I wanted to try to examine was whether, um, whether Minnesota was engaged in the same kind of complacence um, that, uh, that the rest of the nation seemed to be with regard to the welfare of African Americans. And so in order to answer that question for myself, to some degree of satisfaction, was to identify four people who I thought represented a broad and fair uh, uh, profile of, of Minnesota at this particular time. Uh, one was a business person. One was a, a, um, uh, was a farmer and an immigrant, Irish Protestant, who had moved here. A third was a politician. And fourth was a woman who had, in my view, started the suffrage movement in the second half of the 19th century. I'm, I'm assuming I'm running out of time here. So the long and the short of it is, I wanted to look at their lives and try to get some insight into what that experience was like in Minnesota. That's what the book was about. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hate jumping in. I'm like, I'm in class. I'm learning. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, such a, I'm such a history nerd. And this book added some fantastic texture to my understanding of the, of the place where I live and the time period. And I am, yeah, everyone should read this book. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And thank you everyone for your readings and, and chats about your work. Um, and before we have time for some audience questions, I've got one to get us started. So uh, everybody can pop up their lovely faces now. Um, and I heard recently uh, in an interview uh, in which it was stated that the theater has a responsibility to reflect back the current world to its audiences. And I feel like that probably applies just as well to writers. It's a kind of an arts statement <laughs> broadly. Um, and do you, but do you feel a particular responsibility as a writer and, and or historian, several of you are, in this moment, given our global pandemic and struggles against systemic racism and all that's coming to a head in 2020? And if so, has that changed in any way from how you previously viewed the way you, the way you work and, and your, your view of your profession? So just light, light question to chit chat about. <laughs> Well, I'll jump in. Um, it's an, it's a, an intriguing question. I have always believed that writers write most powerfully and movingly and influentially when they are pursuing their own obsessions, fixations, problems. Uh, and in doing so, they will reflect the, the world uh, around us. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know if it is a dictum in theater that you, you should reflect the world around you. Um, I've, I've never set it as my goal to do that. And instead, I've been doggedly uh, looking inward at, at what, um, what makes me run and what, what troubles me and torments me. Um, and I think it should be noted that the authors uh, now who are writing most influentially and powerfully about things like racial injustice, they've been doing it forever. Um, you know, it's not a new preoccupation of theirs. And, um, and it's coming from uh, a long line of their own experiences and their own reflections, thinking and writing. So uh, I, think in, in, I think good writing often does reflect the world in the way um, you suggested, uh, but uh, that that may be more of a uh, side effect than a direct effort in lots of instances. I agree with that. I think that, that um, 
good writing is, is honest writing, is truthful writing, and it's writing in which you're not trying to prove a point. Uh, you're not trying to uh, use it as a platform for something else. Uh, I suppose that people who write like that can be successful, but for me, uh, the most meaningful kind of writing is a writing that gets me in touch with, with what it is to be human, uh, or at least gives me insight from a writer of what, what, what humanity is about. Um, that the, the, the various issues that, that, that deal with social justice issues or politics and whatnot will come from that if you're, if you're sincere. But the, the, that, that's not the primary reason to write. The primary reason is to explore what it is to be human. My head was nodding. <laughs> not as a bobblehead, but in, in agreement. Um, I, I think that um, my work as a writer, whether it's, it's history or nonfiction, um, uh, or poetry uh, reflects the current world um, and, it, and the historical aspects and situations that uh, influenced our current world. Now, we can't escape from uh, the past and that's our, our um, task, I think, is to, to learn and try to apply that to our current situation. I think the poem that I shared is a good example. Uh, Dakota people are star people, and they were deeply observant of the sky and the earth and the connections there. Um, and what do you do when you can't see the stars anymore? Um, I think also that Minnesota is an incredibly diverse place. Uh, geographically, historically, culturally, and sometimes we forget that. Um, and that's what I find inspiring in, in what I write. It's not always happy, it's not always uh, reassuring, but I do think that it's inspiring, especially for creative work. Well, those were fabulous answers. And I guess the, I also agree with everything that's been said. So maybe the only thing that I might add to it is that I'm aware that from the time that I started writing, even as a child, I, I write about what I don't know and what I don't understand. <laughs> So I've never, I've actually never started a book with something I had an idea to say something about because I don't know what I think about something until I've written it and thought it through and witnessed something. But I will say that my work is always maybe concerned with large questions that, um, you know, I want to understand, uh, and I, and I have chosen to understand it through fiction because primarily fiction allows me to, to learn through story. And there's a way in which I trust story to make sense of things that I will never make sense of in the world. You know, I mean, there's, a, there's sort of an order and logic to fiction that is <laughs> evading me every day right now. <laughs> but I think... I would say I'm not sure about this about the theater either because there's plenty of theater that is really purely entertainment and you know you can go to Broadway in New York and see it you know some of the some of the things making the most money in theater are purely entertainment um, and I think there's a spectrum with writers too you know what writers are about but for me I'm about this search and what what I might come to discover, but I think my books uh, raise as many questions as they provide answers. Much fun to just sit here and listen to smart people say smart things. I <laughs> just really appreciate all of you. 
Um, I yeah, I absolutely, and I, I've had I've had teachers, you know, say say things also like you can't start writing knowing where you're going, and I think you all sort of pointed to that in in some way, whether it's writing about the things that are just that won't let you go, or or trying to find where you know where humans where humans are and why humans do what they do, and all of those things are so important um and i guess in a in a similar vein and maybe and hopefully on a more light note i don't know <laughs> i'm 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 super curious about what what's grabbing what's grabbing you all right now what are you what are you curious about what are the things that aren't i guess letting you go where are your questions because those are great things to think about i hope I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm bound and determined to answer a question um, that Neil deGrasse Tyson put out there on social media. And he said, where is the poetry of science? And I'm like waving at my computer screen going, I've got one, I've got one right here and there's more. <laughs> um, but to write about those basic elements of, of life and creation and creativity, um, that, that blue spark, that whatever it is that makes us human, um, whether it's it's describing it physiologically or molecularly. Um, I was a chemistry major as an undergraduate and um, I love drawing benzene rings and uh, loved calculus and physics formulations. Uh, so that's that's my secret <laughs> um, uh, endeavor right now. But now everybody knows. <laughs> Well, let's get a little dark here. <laughs> I'm, I am writing about, I, I just got finished writing about um, a hero who, uh, African-American woman who uh, was one of the leaders of the suffrage movement in Minnesota. And um, within months after the ratification of the 19th Amendment for Minnesota, uh, three black men were, were hung in, in uh, or hanged in, 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 in Duluth. And she um, uh, organized a campaign basically to draft a bill and to lobby the legislature to pass an anti-lynching law. Lynching was not a crime then. Uh, so uh, she succeeded in doing it and, and she was, um, I was just so impressed with her, well, with everything about her. And that was uplifting to learn about her, um, her life, uh, even though she probably didn't feel as happy about how things ended, but that's a separate story. Long and short of it is that was an uplifting story, what she was able to achieve by herself for all intents and purposes. Now I'm working on a story um, about a black attorney in Minneapolis, very successful, who at age 30, uh, age 70, I'm sorry, jumps 10 floors from a balcony to commit suicide. Um, and so the question is, why? And of course, you know, this, you know, Minnesota being Minnesota, Minneapolis being Minneapolis, um, it's a story that is hidden in the footnotes of, of, of the canon for all intents and purposes. And, um, this guy was consequential. He was important. Um, he was, for all intents and purposes, quite successful. Uh, so that just heightens the mystery as to why he would feel compelled at the end of his life, so to speak. Well, I don't know. I'm almost 70, so I shouldn't say at the end of his life. But, um, you know, at, at, a, at, a, at a ripe age where he should be uh, celebrating his, his accomplishments because he had many. 
why would he feel that the only choice he had was to, to commit suicide? Um, that's the question that drives me, even while grading papers, students. So. I've been um, right right now hoping to uh, gather maybe more of the stories of the women um, who are the descendants. As I'm hearing from people, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not ready to leave this book behind. I was interested in what Jack had done with that podcast. When I um, came upon this history, I have a, a little piece of my family in it, but I realize it's a much larger story. And what I'm kind of hoping is to find a way in the universe to um, gather more forces to uh, collect this story. Um, I had just was watching the, the, um, the Epstein documentary and I thought, I'd love to get my hands on these files and see how many of the girls were abused by the same people. You know, how many of the men's names were being repeated, but uh, the files, again, they're sealed by the court. So I feel like it's going to be a really difficult task, but I'm not done with trying to find a way to do right by these girls. So that's, that's kind of the project that is pulling me as a writer right now. One of the themes that um, has followed me throughout all of my writing for many years is the theme of cultural collision. And uh, I have just finished uh, for Smithsonian Magazine a lengthy article that will be published later this year about a wrongful conviction that resulted from a murder that happened in the 1930s on the White Mountain Apache Reservation in Arizona. A, uh, an Apache medicine man was convicted of the murder, uh, but he was clearly framed and spent 20 years in federal prison before he was able to get out. Um, and he got out because of a partnership that he built while he was in prison with um, someone who agreed to um, join him in working on getting him out. And that was the mystery writer, Earl Stanley Gardner, who wrote all the Perry Mason mystery books. And, uh, and Gardner took a strong interest in wrongful convictions and even assembled a group called the Court of Last Resort to help people who had been wrongly convicted of serious crimes to get out of prison and this was in the 1940s and 50s and um, so in the it, it, it's such an interesting meeting of minds uh, this man um, the this white mountain um, apache medicine man silas john edwards and earl stanley gardner how they worked together what they thought of each other what they respected in each other and did not understand of one another and in the course of writing the story, I was able to um, you know, document what happened and, but even better, for the first time in print, name who really did kill uh, the, the person who was murdered back in the 1930s. It certainly was not Silas John Edwards. And it, 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 so it's a continuation of a theme that really uh, I've found in my work for a very long time. I don't know why it's there. Uh, but it's there and it really scratches an itch to um, pursue it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, I, I'm just always interested in what's, what's pulling people along right now, because especially since I think a lot of us who can you know, who, who write or who are you know, engaged in any kind of creative art have really felt a lot of strange strange things <laughs> in the last in the last you know six months especially um it's kind of I, i've talked to a lot of friends who say it's been a bit of a struggle sometimes so 
Um, but I, I appreciate everyone sharing the things that they're that are, that, it's, that are gripping them and that it's exciting. And I thank you all. I think we'll I think we'll start wrapping it up here since the audience seems to be a little quiet this evening, and that's fine. Our friends in Montgomery for for giving us some some space in the virtual land. That is fantastic. And I hope to see you all again soon. And we do have other uh, Moving Words events coming up through the middle of November. So thank you all, writers, audience. I wish you all the very best. Have a great night. <laughs>